of robes and rings and things like this. That's what I'd like to speak to you about today. But before we do that, let's, get, uh, let's just ask the Lord to bless his word. Uh, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that, uh, Lord, it, um, it costs you to give it to us. And it costs the lives of many men and women and generations before us to bring it so that we could have it so freely available in the form that we have it today. Uh, so, Lord, it's a precious thing. Father, we sometimes take it for granted. Forgive us for that, but we pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of it. Father, your word is living and active, it's spiritual, and it's to be, Father, received at the level of our spirit primarily. Father, we thank you, it's, it's food for our, very, uh, our be very being. So we pray that you impart these things to us today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Flip the next one up there. Oh, it's a bit hard to see that. We'll have to turn some lights off. But when I'm talking about rings today, we're not talking about this one from the Lord of the Rings. Um, often when you think about rings, people uh, you know, think about uh, you know, the, the ring of power that old Gollum was chasing. Who's seen the Lord of the Rings? Okay, it's an interesting, interesting um, story with, with all sorts of themes and uh, some biblical, some... Well, it's the, it's the whole thing about good triumphing over evil, isn't it? Um, uh, so it's a great story, but it's a different ring that we're considering today. The ring I'd like us to consider is much more powerful than Tolkien's ring here. Um, the ring I want to consider today is God's signet ring. Um, I don't know if you're, you may be familiar with signet rings. Um, a signet ring can be uh, simply an, an ornate ring designed with numbers or letters or symbols. It can be a ring that's even passed down through generations and families. It can be rings are often associated with uh, clubs or different achievements in society. Uh, or it can be a sign and a signature of royalty. And it's this sign and signature of royalty that I'd like to sort of have a bit of a look at today. In, in uh, historical times and uh, bygone days, signet rings were very common for royalty to have. Kings, queens, emperors, thought they wore these signet rings. And as you can imagine, uh, they would be quite decorative and intricately designed. I've got some up the back there, some ancient Mesopotamian ones. Uh, the purpose was not just for ornamentation, not to make your fingers look not pretty, but the ring served a purpose. Uh, the signet ring was a means to verify and authenticate any message that had the approval of the ruling power. Uh, history has many illustrations of this, and even in our Bible we have on uh, a couple of separate occasions, well there's two separate occasions there, where a person in power uses his signet ring uh, in a key Bible account. Well, the first reference in the Bible to the signet ring is actually in Genesis 41, um, when Pharaoh, king of Egypt, takes off his signet ring and hands it to one Joseph. And uh, just to give you a little bit of context of, of where we're at here without going into lots of detail, uh, God, through Joseph, had just finished uh, telling Pharaoh um, the interpretation of his two dreams. Remember the seven fat cows being eaten up by seven thin cows and then seven fat ears of corn being consumed by seven thin ears of corn. Uh, this is a strange dream that uh, uh, um, Pharaoh got and Joseph was able to interpret it. Through the Holy Spirit, God revealed to Joseph that Pharaoh's dreams were just one dream really in meaning, uh, but that uh, Pharaoh or Egypt was going to have seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. 
Joseph then came, went on, not only to, after having interpreted the dream, but he actually had a, a word of wisdom. He gave Pharaoh some wise counsel on what he should do next. And so uh, Joseph said, uh, find a, you know, a good overseer, a good administrator, build some part barns, fill them you know, during the good years, save up uh, for the bad years. <clears throat> and of course, the spirit of God that was in this totally blew Pharaoh away. I mean, you'd think it would be fairly conventional wisdom to knowing that there were years of famine coming and you were in good years to save up. Amen? Um, that's sort of fairly basic sort of wisdom. But anyway, because this was delivered through the Spirit of God by Joseph, Pharaoh was just totally blown away. And it says in Genesis 41, verse 37 to 40, this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. So Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find anyone else like this? One, he's referring to Joseph here, one in whom is the Spirit of God. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this and there's no one so discerning and wise as you, you shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. It's an interesting little passage here, we'll get back to it. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see I've set you over all the land of Egypt... And removing his signet ring from his hand, Pharaoh put it on Joseph's hand and he arrayed him in garments of fine linen put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the chariot of his second in command. Okay, so Pharaoh is blown away by the wisdom that uh, Joseph comes up with and so he exalts him, makes him number two in the, in the kingdom. But again says only... In the throne am I am, uh, will I be greater than you. Amen. There is a parallel here to, uh, I mean, to the New Testament. I mean, this is a type and shadow of something that happens in the New Testament where uh, we are given a signet ring. And probably for most of you Bible studies know that, well, who is the signet ring? Who is the seal of our redemption? It's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we've been given the Holy Spirit. And even as Joseph was exalted, you know, to a very high place in the kingdom, yet Pharaoh was still over him in the, uh, in the aspect of the throne. And we too have been exalted uh, to, into heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Yet he is over us in respect to the throne. Amen? But, you know, I think for Christians, if we could only grasp the place we've been exalted to and the power that we have uh, through the Holy Spirit. All right, let's move on here. Um, the second reference to giving of a ring uh, occurred, or uh, well, uh, the main one that uh, comes after this one in Genesis, is in the book of Esther. And you remember the, the story of Esther. It was ty a time of uh, captivity where the, God's people, the Israelites, were being ruled over by the Babylonians and then the Persians. They'd been scattered from their land because of disobedience and they were living in Babylon uh, or in that, uh, that vicinity. They were scattered across uh, Mesopotamia there. And uh, being ruled over by a king who, who wasn't particularly dis, uh, disposed towards Jewish people. In fact, he had his prime minister, his right-hand man, was a man called Haman, who actually hated the Jews and uh, was quietly plotting their downfall, wanting to see them wiped off the face of the earth. Again, these things are types and shadows of New Testament reality. Amen? We have an enemy who would like to see us Christians pushed off the face of the earth. And he's working in our society today. Amen. And we're talking about the devil here, of course. But, you know, we see the effects of his work and so much, uh, you know, freedoms that Christians have uh, being shut down. But let, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here. Do we have to accept this? Not at all. What do we have to do? Take a stand. And just taking a stand resists the devil. But, you know, it's interesting... Um, 
probably the, the thing that the Christians do probably the least of is, is take stands. And how do we take a stand? Through just prayer. Intercession and prayer. But that's another thing. So let's get back to Esther here. Um, Esther eventually wins the king over. God creates, gives Esther favour. And uh, it's an interesting story there without getting into uh, to too much detail in it. She eventually wins the king's favour and trust. And on that day, in Esther 8, chapter 1, uh, verse 1 and 2, on that day the king, Ahasuerus, gave the house of Haman the Jews' enemy to Esther the queen. And Mordecai, who was her, her uncle, came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. Mordecai had, was uh, Esther's uncle, and Haman had decided that Mordecai was one of these Jewish guys that they had to get rid of. And while he was getting rid of Mordecai, he might as well get rid of the whole population of them. And so God turned the things around due to prayer and intercession, which is not really what I, I want to focus on today. But it goes on in verse 2, The king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, this evil prime minister, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai, Esther now the queen of this, uh, well it, actually it was a, a, um, of this Babylonian kingdom, uh, Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Mordecai, like Joseph, is suddenly exalted to second in the kingdom. Only in the throne is the king greater. Amen? So he's now in this incredible position of influence and power. Um, king Ahasuerus had given the king, uh, uh, the ring originally to Haman. This was his power and authority that he carried with him. Um, and King Ahasuerus didn't have full knowledge of Haman's plan to terminate all the Jews. Uh, it's also worth mentioning here that when the king took off his ring from the hand of Haman, that was the end of Haman. When that authority was taken away from him, the next thing that happened to Haman is he, he, he had a, a, an appointment with the gallows. Interesting book. So this is of great significance, because uh, when we look at the Bible, it shows us an interconnection between the signet ring, that ring of authority, and God the Holy Spirit. So when there's a removal of authority, there is that, that previous authority, uh, you know, is virtually condemned to, to death or to mm -hmm. total ineffectiveness. Yep. Amen? And we have been given authority, we have been given a signet ring, and when it's removed from us, we become useless. Amen? I think there's another scripture there that talks about, you know, us having salt in ourselves. And what happens when the salt becomes you know, tasteless. What's well, good for nothing, being thrown out. And we don't want that to happen to us in our Christian lives, amen? We want to be full of the Holy Spirit, know the authority we've given, and, and use it, not let it be taken away from us. Lest we, uh, yes, we'll get to heaven maybe. Uh, yes, I will, should I say, we will get to heaven. Uh, we'll see that in just a second. I've got another scripture, or another passage we're going to study in a second. But, you know, we don't want to be useless. We don't want to get to God and, and just have no reward on that day. You know, and, and be called a, a worthless servant. Okay, so Esther uh, chapter 8, we'll go to pick it up in verse 4. The king held out the golden scepter to Esther. And Esther rose and stood before the king, and she said... If it pleases the king, and I have won his favour, and if this thing seems right before the king, and I have his approval, let an order be written to revoke the letters uh, devised by Haman, son of uh, Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote, giving orders to destroy the Jews who were in the provinces of the king. This guy Haman had set it up and sent messages all over the kingdom that at a certain date, people to rise up and kill every Jew that they could get their hands on. So here, Esther, now they, this... This command carried the signet ring, the approval of the king. And it couldn't be revoked, according to these Babylonian laws. 
So that thing was out there. And so Esther issues another one. And she says in it that, um, for how, verse 6, for how can I bear to see the calamity that's coming on my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to the Jew Mordecai, See, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he plotted to lay hands on the Jews. You may write as you please regarding the Jews, in the name of the king, and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. Interesting, isn't it? So she is given virtually a blank check. She's given a blank page of... You know, with the, the, put the king's signature there, and she can write whatever she likes. And of course, as you go in and read the story, uh, she gave you know the Jews not only permission to rise up against their enemies, but uh, you know the Jews became the flavour of the month in Babylon at that particular time. So instead of experiencing a bunch of disfavour, favour flowed to them. Again, this is a type and shadow of New Testament reality. God can, has declared in our favour. And God has caused favour to come upon his people. But we need to rise up in that favour. Amen? Yes, amen. So, the reason for both of these ring transfers that we read about were identical. The king... We're showing that the person who received the signet ring, which was Joseph and Mordecai, had the king's authority in matters delegated to these men. Uh, most often the ring was given so that any edict or decree, uh, as well a decision made, could be written down, sealed with wax, as usually in those days, and they still do today on certain documents, they put some, melt some wax and then put it in your stamp. We as a church have a seal as well. Um, that uh, we've hidden away. So on certain official documents, we can attach our seal to it. Um, interesting, I found that seal, this is a few years ago, where the youth had it. And <laughs> they were using it to, uh, you know, stamp on people's wrists coming into a youth event. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Good use of it. But it, <laughs> it was given, they were <laughs> giving people authority. Uh, to enter the hall or not. Okay, so uh, this sealed document that uh, with the king's uh, signet ring pressed in the wax was official and was to be obeyed. And anybody who broke that seal before its intended delivery would be subject to death. Uh, there's a fascinating scripture in the Old Testament book of Haggai uh, in Haggai 2 verse 23, which I haven't got up here, but we're, we're just going to jump over it and we're just going to mention it in passing, um, where a, a, an actual person is called God's signet ring. Uh, this guy was Zerubbabel, one of the last kings in, uh, in Judea before the, 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 all the people were kicked out of there. And uh, God was going to use him to be a shepherd or governor of his people. And so he called him a signet ring. Um, so this guy was going to be the sort of uh, the focal point of God's people returning. He was going to be the king that was going to be released back when the people were released from cap captivity. In a broader sense, it's, it's also a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his future role. Um, in that particular time, it referred to this king Zerubbabel, but you know Jesus led a people back from captivity. He leads people back from captivity. He has the power and authority of God to do that. So when we attach our, you know, our destiny with his, we join our destiny with him, then God, uh, you know, we, we get brought back from captivity. Okay, so um, we need to understand our favoured position in receiving God's signet ring. It's an important thing for us. Uh, for Joseph and Mordecai to receive the king's ring, they had to hold the highest position of esteem uh, and honour in the kingdom. Um, they had to be loved and trusted by their respective kings in order to receive this favour, amen? So, as followers of the Lamb, as we are, as subject of the King of Kings, 
we have been given God's signet ring through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to explore that a little bit more next week. But let us consider what this exalted position means to us. Um, this ring means four things, at least four things to us. It means approval. It means access. It means an assignment that we have received. And it also means an authority that we have. Okay, let's have a look at this. Um, when it comes to approval, as I said, signet rings weren't just given to anybody. You couldn't just, you know, they, they, they were precious things. In fact, if you had any sort of authority, even families would have them. You just didn't give your signet ring to anybody. It's like, you know, your, your password for your bank account. You don't give that away, uh, or at least you shouldn't. Um, signet rings uh, were given to trusted and loved subjects. There was only one signet ring the king had. Once he'd given that away, um, you know, he, didn't, he couldn't give it again. He could take it back, but that would probably mean the end of that person who had it. It would mean that, uh, you know, that all trust and, and uh, confidence in that person had dissipated, and that person in those days was probably likely to execution. So... Uh, we are approved by God, it says. There's scriptures up here. Um, okay, First Thessalonians 2 verse 4. We speak as men approved by God. Do you know that? That you speak through the Holy Spirit within you as people that are approved by God. God's approval is in, with, on you. 2 Timothy 2.15. And it says here, Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly expands the word of truth. One who has done the Key of Knowledge seminar. <laughs> is that adding to the word? Well, there is this aspect, you know, we can be approved, but our approval uh, can increase. Amen? So there are levels of approval. We are approved by God, we're loved by God. We're not talking about love, God's love here. We're talking about his approval. And you can increase that on yourself. And with the increase of approval comes increase in authority. Amen? So 2 Timothy says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. This is from the New Living Translation. I thought I'd get a simpler translation. Uh, be a good worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly explains the word of truth. So saying, look, labour in the word to get to know it. And thirdly there, uh, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 18, when people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is for the Lord to commend them. Amen? So, you know, there are people that have been approved by God and there are people that haven't received that approval. But we all want to see, receive the approval of God, don't we? In greater and greater degree. And to some degree, that approval uh, does depend on us and our response to God. Amen? All right. Uh, so that's the approval aspect. God loves us and made us joint ears with Christ. Um, and, you know, our, our approval is at the highest possible level uh, in terms of approval that's available in the universe. We are approved by the greatest power in the universe the creator of all the universe. But God has said, look, you know, still press in for more. If you're getting hot in the front row, you can always move to the back. Okay. <laughs> access. The second thing I wanted to, we've talked about approval, let's talk about access. Those who had the approval of the king had constant and immediate and welcome access to the king. It was a good thing to be able to have access to people of power. Amen? Even today, people fight and do all sorts of things to try to get the ear of those in, uh, in places of influence, in places of power. Uh, but back in those days, if you could walk into the presence of the king any time you wanted to, that was a powerful thing. These Babylonian kings, and even the Persian ones that, um, that, uh, that followed them, if you went into the presence of the king unwelcomed, or uninvited, that was the end of you. 
you would be executed, killed. Um, but so for somebody to be able to walk into the presence of a king without being invited was a, a, an incredible privilege. That, they, that meant that they had, you know, immense favour with that particular king. So when the king heard um, that they were approaching, uh, he would say, let them in. And so we too have access to our king. Amen? We don't have to go and, and, and ham, uh, beat down the door. We have access to our king. Through Jesus we have access to our, the king. Ephesians 2.18 Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Uh, for us. Romans 5.2 Again from the New Living Translation It says because of our faith Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyf joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Okay, we've been brought into a place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to what's going to happen there. Where God's glory is going to, you know, we're going to enter into that. And then Hebrews 4 verse 16, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help when we need it the most. Amen? So there we have access to the Father. If we have access, we need to really access it, don't we? Pointless having access and not accessing it. You could get into trouble that way. Uh, doing that. All right, the next thing that comes along with after approval and access is assignment. Okay, that ring wasn't given just to make your hand look pretty. Amen? It's not, uh, be, being a ring bearer wasn't just being a, courti a courtier in the, the king's court. Um, just somebody who had access, but they had work to do. Uh, they had an assignment. They represented the king. They bore his signet ring for a purpose. It was to carry out, to act in an executive fashion uh, f for him, to see his will get done. Amen? So he gave, us, gave them, gave us a signet ring to see the work get done. It's not just so we can, you know, feel happy and clappy. Uh, it's not just so that we can, you know, sit in tongue and speak in tongues. That's all part. But there's an assignment that God's given us. Um, John 15, 16. I think this is something Alan shared last week. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Amen? So God's appointed us to bear fruit, to go. Go and bear fruit. Not sit and bear fruit. Go and bear fruit. Um, 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from the beginning of time. Okay? He saved us and called us to live a holy life. To show us his grace through Jesus Christ. So, yes, go and live a holy life. That's part of our assignment. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18 and Paul says, And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, and Christ, or God, has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Amen? So we can go into people's lives with God's authority. First of all, we have the authority to go. How many ever get pushed back by, you know, the, the little voice in our ear sometimes saying, hey, you have no right doing that, no right saying that? Well, actually, the highest authority in the world says, yes, we can. We can be bold. And God will take care of the consequences of our boldness, which sometimes uh, can land us in a bit of trouble. But praise God, it's better to be in trouble uh, because of our boldness in going than, uh, you know, getting in trouble because we didn't go. All right, so our king has given us, each of us, unique assignments. I can't do your assignment, you can't do my assignment. We all have a calling, a destiny, a purpose, an assignment from God. Just like Mordecai had, Esther had, and Joseph himself. 
Um, all of these are important, they're urgent, and they've been designed by God himself. The final thing that we'll look at here is this whole aspect of authority. Um, having the signet ring didn't just mean being approved, having access and assignment, but it also meant um, that uh, you had real power, real power and authority. Amen? Um, on my way to church today, I was stopped by the police. Um, it was just, he was just a little fella, um, but he was parked on the side of the road. I don't know how many of you are coming around the back of the football ground up there, stopped for the random breath test. You were thinking I was going to have to confess here to some speeding thing, weren't you? What a base thought. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, we all get hit with these random uh, breath tests, don't we? And, uh, you know, all he did was he stood there in the street and waved me down. Um, he had authority. So I stopped. I mean, that guy, you know, if you had some big uh, road train coming down the road, uh, you know, several hundreds of ton of truck, he could step out, a policeman could step out, put his hand up, and that thing would stop. You or me could get out and put that, our hand up, and that thing would probably go straight over the top of us. Uh, <laughs> the difference is the authority. We have real authority. Can you see the man's authority? Well, no, it's just something we know is there. Amen? And you know, the spiritual world recognise that authority. Angels recognise that authority that's in us. And demons recognise it as well. When we stand in our authority. But so often we're pushed back off our authority. I mean, from the earliest age, how many of you in here have been parents or are parents or something? What do your kids try to do? They try to take that parental authority off you, don't they? they? There's always that pushback going on. Well, that's what it's like in the spiritual realm. And woe betide the parent that lets his children take authority in his home. Uh, you know, you're, you're headed for a, a difficult life. And as Christians, we need to stand in that authority that God has given us and deal with the demonic world as it comes to us. Amen? Not go out there looking for fights necessarily. The fights come to us. We need to stand and take that authority. Okay. Um, okay, we have marching orders um, from our king, knowing that he's going with us. Here we go, Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority in heaven and earth, as Jesus said, has been given to me, therefore, go. Okay, this. Uh, so the authority that's been given him, he's also given to us. Not the fullness of it, but enough, certainly, to accomplish any purpose he calls us to do. You may not have authority to do something he's not called you to do. Amen? There are measures of grace. There are measures of authority that we all have. Uh, but, you know, you are faithful in the, that which you have received, and God will give you more. Amen? He who is faithful in a little will be faithful in much. He who is not faithful by... Um, uh, you know, by extrapolation here, he who is not uh, uh, faithful in, in the little authority won't be faithful in, if he gets more authority. Okay, Mark 1 verse 27. We're close to an end here, guys, so let joy arise. Uh, <laughs> Mark 1 27. Amazement gripped the audience. This is Paul, uh, Ma, uh, sorry, uh, Jesus preaching. And they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. When Jesus preached, man, people were just, they, they were gobsmacked. They just, you know, that wasn't just the usual academic thing that, uh, that they had heard. Religious uh, teaching that they had heard. When Jesus taught, there was power and authority being released. And amen? We want that too. I mean, that's, that's what's available to us. 1 Peter 3.22. Now, Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honour next to God and all the angels and authorities and, and powers accept his authority. So that's where he is, and he's, he's the one who's backing us up. 
Amen? He is superior on the throne to us. Uh, but you know, we're called to be like him. And the Bible says we're seated in heavenly places with him. We'll look at a little bit more of that next time. But we've also been looking at that sort of stuff for quite a long time now. Amen? Learning how to move in the authority of God. Amen? Here's a quote from a guy called Abraham Kuyper, who was a, um, a, a pastor, a teacher, a, a Christian philosopher uh, earlier last century. He said, In the total expanse of human life, there is not a single square inch of which the Christ, who alone is sovereign, does not declare, that is mine. There is nothing here on earth that Jesus is not Lord over, that he not, does not declare, not a single person, uh, you know, not a single penny, whatever. Uh, there's not a single thing that Jesus' Lordship doesn't extend over. He is, you know, he is, in, he, he's over everything. And, and, you know, that's the king we serve. That's what's behind us. That's what's bank, uh, backing us up. And we as believers need to believe that in order to see it. For if we believe, then we shall see the power of God released. If we back off that authority, you know, it's a bit like that dog that backs you down as you're going off to, you know, knock on some person's door. And the dog comes out and he starts barking at you. And how do you encourage that dog in his barkiness? Uh, you retreat. You know, there, 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 and, and show fear. And that will encourage him. But if you just get up to him and just look him in the eyes and get, get out of here, or, you know, just if you show confidence and uh, stand there, you'll back him off. Amen? Amen? And we need to do that with, with, in our, ad, with our adversary. Uh, in, you know, in the spiritual realm. We need to treat them as dogs and back them off. Amen? All right. Uh, we'll bring the third major reference. And I'm going to actually talk about this next week in a little bit more detail. Um, in the giving of, of a ring, the third, third major biblical reference there is... Um, used in Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. Um, this is almost a perfect illustration, uh, spiritually speaking, of God the Father having compassion and showing mercy by placing uh, on his, his prodigal son his love um, and his acceptance and giving him a salvation from his circumstances. This is a picture of how our God works with us. Amen. Uh, so, first of all, notice, and we're not going to go into great detail, I just want to bring out one or two points here, that uh, the father was waiting for the son's return, and he saw him a long way off. He probably saw the son returning, well, he did see the son returning, probably before the son saw him. Amen. And God's like that. Uh, you know, whatever situation or circumstance we find ourselves in, when we wander from God, God's already seen you. He's looking for you to return. And then what does he do? Luke 15, verse 22. And the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Okay, put a, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. What's the best robe? The robe of righteousness. It's the robe of, that we get through the blood of Jesus. Our garments were filthy. We get a new robe. And for most Christians, we have no trouble getting, taking on the robe of righteousness, don't we? We believe we're saved. Yep. Yeah? Okay, I mean, nobody, if somebody come up to you and said, oh, you're not really saved. I mean, look at your hair. Look, look, at, your, look at your shoes. What will we say in that situation? Get out of here, you idiot. Okay, I know Australians would say something a little bit stronger maybe, uh, but we New Zealanders are known for our politeness. So um, you'd, you'd back them off quickly in that situation, wouldn't you? We have no trouble receiving that robe of righteousness. 
Amen? Christendom generally takes the robe of righteousness. Yes, we're happy there. Yep. But we're also given a ring here. Okay, so what was the father's point of giving his father, the, uh, the father giving the son the ring? Maybe he had smelly fingers and... No, he wanted to, the son to know that he was being restored yes. to everything that he had walked away from, that he had lost. Amen? So I don't think the young guy grabbed the checkbook straight away and started, you know, bang, bang, bang on it. Uh, but he could have. He had to learn, I guess, he had to have his conscience cleansed. He had to learn to take his place again by the side of the Father. But that option was completely open to him. Amen? So the ring is given to us as well. And also some shoes. We'll talk about that next week. Anybody want to guess what the shoes are all about? Assignment. Amen. Okay, so just as Gollum and Bilbo and Frodo and all those guys fought over the power of the wing, uh, the ring, the wing, over the ring, um, even as forces of evil lined up to fight uh, for the power of the ring, um, well, that... The sovereign God of this universe has given us, we are too, ring bearers. And the fight is against us as well. Uh, we have approval, access, assignment and authority. Amen? It was a special day when Pharaoh took that ring off his finger and handed it to Joseph. It was a special day when uh, Ahasuerus took the ring off his finger and handed it to Mordecai and said, go, rule in my name. It was a special day when we received the Holy Spirit. And with receiving the Holy Spirit, we received everything that God had for us. Approval, access, assignment, and authority. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. Father, for this wonderful opportunity. Just, Father, this is who we are. Father, we're not that old... A uh, person that was subject to every uh, attack or every uh, evil thing that's in this world. Uh, Father, you delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of your Son. And Father, it was, wasn't just a, you didn't just leave us there. Father, you, 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 are, you actually came to live inside of us. And Father, you made the full extent of your kingdom's power and riches available to us. But Father, you also veiled it from us. You hid it from us for a reason as well. And that you require us to press in. Not just to take these things for granted, but to press in. Even as Jesus, Father, uh, learned obedience, Father, through the things that he suffered... Lord, we're called to walk in the same manner as he did. And yes, Father, there is suffering out there. You've promised us that. But Father, it's not an eternal suffering. It's not a suffering that will do uh, eternal damage to us. It's something, Father, we can overcome. Just as Jesus overcome, overcame in all things, so we too, Lord, can be called to overcome. And so, Father, we thank you for these things. Lord, I just pray for every person here today, Lord God, that, uh, that Father, you put us, every one of us, in, a, in touch with that authority. You give us opportunity to stand in that authority. We pray for divine appointments, divine circumstances to come out about in our life that, Father, will give us opportunity to rise up, Father, through the Holy Spirit in the power and authority of Jesus. Uh, Father... We thank you. Father, this is the normal Christian life that you call us to. And Father, we thank you that, uh, Lord, I know there are people here today wondering about what their assignment is, wonder what God's calling them to. Well, I thank you, Father, it's, it's little by little, line by line, precept by precept, one step at a time, you lead us into that destiny. And so we thank you for that, Lord God. So, Father, I just commit everybody here and myself to you. Uh, Father, we thank you that um, it, our way lies not in ourself, but it's through the Holy Spirit and abiding in that vine, Father, we, we, we bear fruit in all aspects of life. 
and in the process, Father, grow up into his fullness. That, Father, when he appears, we'll be like him. Father, that's our, that's, Father, that's our vision. Father, that's Father, the, the direction that we, we, that we decide that we're going to walk in. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.